everybody, it's Ryan Metzler here again, and today we're going to talk about a game that I am very excited for, uh, and that game is Merlin. Uh, this is a new Steffen Feld game, uh, which I guess excited is the wrong word. I'm a, a bit apprehensive, but also a bit excited, uh, because this is a new Steffen Feld game with also a co-designer named Michael Ryanick. I don't know him, uh, but it comes from Queen Games, and I historically uh, have not been a fan of many of their titles, uh, except for Lancaster. Great game. But uh, new Steffen Feld themed around the Knights of the Round Table, King Arthur and Merlin. Uh, and it looks to be a Rondell style game. So uh, we're going to open this up. We're going to put it on the table. I'll play it several times. We'll come back uh, and we're going to talk about my thoughts on Merlin. So here you can see the setup for Merlin. Now, this game is Feld's newest title in which you are playing a Knight of the Round Table vying to be the next king. Uh, and you're going to use your knights, which are these little representative pieces around this Rondell here, as well as Merlin in order to try and do this by taking various actions. The main driving force behind the game is die rolling. Uh, and so at its very heart, this game is a roll and move with some manipulation involved in order to allow you to move a little bit more freely, uh, hopefully. So the game will be played over six rounds, scoring rounds at two, four, and six, of course, at the end of the game. Uh, what you're going to do in these rounds is first prepare. Uh, preparation is basically rolling your dice. So you'll roll your dice, uh, and you'll put them over here, and you'll have those dice available for use. Now, on a player's turn, they are going to use one of their dice. You'll see we have three colored dice, uh, and we have a white die here. The colored dice will allow you to move your knight that many pips in the clockwise direction and clockwise direction only. The white die allows you to move Merlin, and Merlin has the special ability where he can move in either direction that many pips. Now, players also have a variety of other things, and we're going to talk about those as we talk about the various actions that you can take on your turn. So let's dive into each of those actions briefly. You'll see around this rondelle there are six different houses or provinces or whatever they call them, uh, represented by the different colored spaces on the board. Each one of these spaces, when you land on it, lets you take one of four possible actions. And those four actions are associated with these four henchmen that you can see on your board here. So when you land on one of these spaces, you can send one of the henchmen out to the space on the board, uh, the matching space. If somebody else's piece is already there, it gets sent back. Uh, and when you do this, you take one of four actions. And those actions are take a building material of that color. Uh, sorry, let's do the purple one since that's where I'm standing. Take a building material of that color. You can take a flag of that color, a shield of that color, uh, or you may place an influence out onto the tower associated with that province. So depending on which one of these guys you place, the builder, the shieldsman, the flag bearer, or the influence lady, I don't know what her name is, uh, she lets you place out the influence. So you place one of your four and you take the appropriate action. Now why are you doing these things? Well, uh, there are various reasons, but in the game you're going to start with some mission cards, and those mission cards have various things you either want to collect or have out on the board. For example, this one says you want to have your flag bearer in the Orange Province, so as soon as I do that on my turn I can trade this in for a victory point. Or this one here says I want to have my lady uh, in the purple area, so if I put her out here, um, I would be able to get my one victory point. This one here says I want to have a blue and an orange flag. Uh, or this one here says I need to have two people in the purple area and I get two victory points. So you can see there's a variety of different options for you to try and accumulate things. Now, Building materials, shields, and flags all have additional abilities that are useful, as does placing influence, which will score you points later in the round. Now, moving on, you'll see the next space here gives you something for having influence in an area. When you land on one of these spaces, you may, in any area you currently have an influence, so for green it would be black, take a cube from that area, one area only. These are also existing for shields. You can do it to place a person, or you can do it to get a flag. So uh, there are four different actions associated with this. The last one actually lets you get victory points uh, for the number of areas you have influence in. The next space here lets you discard your cards, any of your mission cards, and take up to two new ones. So discard up to two, take two new ones. The next place out here you'll see is a little picture of a building going onto a hex, and this exists in several places on the board. When you land on this, you may use the building materials you acquire throughout the game, uh, which are these little cubes, in order to build out in this area out here. Now this area has a variety of different hexes, and those hexes will make up areas, or sub-areas, of the same type. So you can see some kind of hilly areas here, there's a three-size forest area there, a four-size water area here. 
When you build out here, you're going to use a building material and that building material will dictate where you can build. Or more appropriately, the columns show you what type of building material may be used to build in them. So for example, black can be used to build in any of these spaces here, here, or here. Purple would let you build here, here, or there. And of course, there'll be some overlap where certain areas let you be, or can be built on by three different colors. For example, this one right here can be built on by brown, orange, or blue. Now, when you build on these, you may get a benefit. For example, the ones with the towers let you place an influence or take a flag or take a shield of any color. Uh, the other spaces, however, don't give you any benefit. However, there will be an area majority scoring for each one of the individual sub areas at the end of the second, fourth, and sixth rounds. Now, the next couple areas are pretty straightforward. For example, this one will give you victory points for each flag you have when you land on it. Same thing here for building materials, shields, uh, and I already covered the one that gives you victory points for each influence you have on the board. This space here, when you land on it, is going to let you take Excalibur. Now, Excalibur is going to let you kill one of the traitors that you'll see at your castle right here. So each player has three traitors per uh, two game rounds that they're trying to vanquish in order to not lose victory points. Getting rid of all of these will require shields to block them. So for example, the blue guy requires a blue shield. Uh, or you can use Excalibur to kill one immediately and you'll have one less. Also, if you hold Excalibur and have no traitors at the end of the second, fourth, or sixth rounds, you'll get three bonus victory points. Then there's a couple of spaces that you kind of have to move around the board to find. So one right here lets you trade any single building material flag or shield for another of the same of, of those things. So a building flag, a building flag or material. So I could trade a black shield, for example, for a brown cube. Then we have the last space right here, or I think second to last space, I should say. Uh, this one lets you move any one of your placed henchmen adjacent one province clockwise or counterclockwise. So if I landed on here and I were green, I could move my builder to here and take a purple cube or move my builder to here and take a gray cube. The last spot on the board is the chalice here. Uh, and this chalice lets you take the chalice when you land on it, either from the board or from another player. Uh, and when you get the chalice, you get an apple. Now we haven't talked about apples yet, but apples are one of the ways you can manipulate your movement around the board. So when you want to use a die, you may first spend an apple, putting it back on the board, and rotate the die to any side you want. So this is a way to mitigate the luck in rolling. That grail is also a benefit for breaking influence ties, which we'll talk about here just in a moment when we talk about scoring. Now there's a couple of things I haven't covered yet. One is these little stabs that you can see here. So uh, you get three Merlin stabs to start the game. Anytime you move Merlin using the white die, uh, you may spend one of those stabs in order to take two actions, the same action twice with Merlin. Uh, so that's one thing that you can do to double your actions. Uh, the other thing I haven't talked about is these flags, which are of course good for finishing cards. I showed you a card here that requires two different flags. You don't turn any of this stuff in when you score, so you get to keep those flags despite getting the two victory points. However, each one of these flags also has an ability. So when you get them, if you don't have a use for them on a card, or perhaps you've already turned in your card, you will get to use the ability on these flags at your own discretion, discarding the flag back to the board. So the blue flag lets you move counterclockwise instead of clockwise uh, on your turn. The gray, uh, gray flag here will let you turn in two mission cards and get two bonus victory points on a turn, whereas usually you can only turn in one. The black card will let you get, or black flag will let you get rid of one full stack of these traders. So if you happen to have multiple of the same type of trader, this is really good. The brown flag lets you move across the board before or after your move and take that action. Uh, so if you move before, then you would move from that space. If you move after, you take the action. The orange flag is going to let you take the action of anybody else's knight, and the purple flag will let you rotate a die to its opposite face in case that helps you in some type of way. So you're going to play in this manner until each player has taken their four actions with their four dice, and uh, you'll move on to the next round. Now at the end of round one, three, and five, this is simply re-rolling your dice and proceeding on. But at the end of round two, four, and six, you're going to have a scoring. The first thing you'll do is make sure that you've either repelled all of your different traders, having the matching shield and discarding it back to the board to get rid of the trader, uh, or that you've used Excalibur or the special ability of the black flag to get rid of them. If you have, you will lose no points, but if you have any remaining unrepelled trader, you will lose three points per. Additionally, at this point, if you happen to have Excalibur and you got rid of all of your traders, you'll get three bonus points. From there, you're going to draw three more traders. So everyone will get rid of their traders and you will get three more from this stack. And these are always random. So you're always gonna grab three more and replenish them out onto your board as such. 
Then you do the rest of the scoring and it's all laid out on the board. So the first scoring you'll do is for these areas out here. And whoever has the majority in each one of these sections, so for example, there's a five area here, if green were to have the only manor on that, they would score five points because it's a five area in size. This one would be worth three, this one four, these would be one a piece. Uh, and this one three or two. So you get the idea there. Uh, if there's a tie, you simply divide by the number of tied players and round down for how many points you get. The next scoring is going to be for influence in these towers. So, for example, let's say green had placed another influence here. Maybe they somehow managed to place two. When we score this area, this is going to be worth three points for the player that has the majority, in this case green. Now if there were a tie, now it would be worth two points, one for each thing here, but whoever has the grail may use it once to break a tie. In this case, instead of green getting one and blue getting one, green would use the chalice to break it for two points. The last thing you'll do in scoring is you're going to score for each one of your, your henchmen that you have out on the board. So if green had placed more henchmen out on the board, for example, something like this, they would score one point per henchman they have on the board for a total of three points. At this point, you're going to start another round, on to round three, and then at the end of rounds four and six, you would have another scoring. And at the end of the game, you're going to score additional points for having leftover resources, leftover apples, which are worth one point apiece, and leftover stabs, which are worth two points apiece. And whoever has the most points will be the winner. And there you have it. That is Merlin by Steffenfeld, uh, another designer, Michael Reinick, uh, and Queen Games. Uh, now, when I got this, as I said, very um, excited but apprehensive because uh, his Historically, not a big fan of Queen Games, but a huge fan of Stefan Feld. Uh, although I will say that over the last several years, my love for that has been declining as well. Now, this game, uh, as I said at the beginning of the overview, is essentially a roll and move. You do have four dice, you roll all of them. Uh, you have two different pieces you can move. Most of them are, well, one of them only in one direction, one of them in both. Uh, so that gives you a couple of options. With that said, uh, there's a significant luck factor in the dice that you roll here, uh, and there is is not a lot of ways for you to mitigate that luck factor. Yes, if you roll multiples, uh, for example, three fours, uh, you are forced to re-roll, so you get some diversity in the way that the dice work out, uh, but there's still a relatively set pattern of a uh, number of different ways that you can combine those dice to move around the board. The apples, uh, which you can only obtain in one fashion in the base game, uh, give you a way to manipulate those dice, as does obtaining some of the flags, which lets you flip to the other side of a die or uh, move yourself across the board. However, there's still a relatively limited aspect of of, uh, choice that you have in how to move around that rondelle. Uh, and this made the game fall a little bit flat for me, uh, simply because uh, while there's a lot of different ways for you to score points, there's a lot of potential things for you to do, on each individual turn you don't have that many choices in how to optimize that. Uh, do I want to take the one or the six first, or the three? Uh, and if I take one of those, that kind of pins me down to these next two potential moves. Uh, doubling actions with Merlin and the fact that he can move either direction is great, but I feel like if there was a tech tree or something that would allow me to somehow manipulate the dice, uh, or the workers like you have in something like Castles of Burgundy that lets you manipulate those dice up or down when you need to use them. Uh, that would have been a great benefit to this game in general. Uh, so while I don't hate it for being a roll and move, and I don't think it's a terrible game overall, uh, I think it's somewhat limited in terms of the choice that you can make, uh, and that turns me off. Now, there is a couple of expansions, or are a couple of expansions that come in the, uh, in the game. Uh, the first is a couple of additional tiles for those little provinces, or whatever you want to call it, the area where you build your manners, uh, in terms for that area control victory point scoring at each of the two uh, spaced rounds, so two, four, and six. Uh, those tiles are going to give you benefits for any of the land that you build on. So I showed there were some tiles where there was no benefit for building there. Uh, these will give you a benefit no matter where you build, and it could be extra Merlin stabs, so extra doubling of his actions uh, or victory points. Uh, it could be apples and victory points or more flags or more shields based on where your influence is at. And that, I think, does improve the game. Uh, if I remember correctly, that's part of the Queenies 1 and 2 that uh, were included with the Kickstarter. Additionally, there's a module you can include uh, where instead of getting victory points for turning in cards, uh, if you look back at the cards, you'll note that there's a picture of the different henchmen at the bottom. So the builder, uh, the shield bearer, the flag bearer, and the lady in waiting, I think her name might be. Um, 
when you when you build with those cards, or when you finish those cards, instead of trading them in for victory points, you can get some type of tech tree where you choose an ability uh, based on the victory point value and type of card that you're turning in, uh, and that will modify your play for the rest of the game. So a lot of these are an extra victory point whenever you complete a card of that type. Uh, but some of them are the ability to put your henchman wherever you would like when you're triggering the action to place him. So usually you must place in the same province that's triggering it, uh, but this lets you place anywhere. Uh, and the last abilities are truly powerful, but only usable once per game. So it's a double build of manners uh, or a... Um, I think it's a free kill of one of your traders and you get some victory points with it. Uh, and, and the third one I'm forgetting at the moment, but they're very strong, but it's just not enough of a change to the game to make it exciting. So uh, overall, I'm gonna have to say that a little disappointed, this one falls flat for me. It won't stay in the collection, uh, but if it sounds interesting to you, please feel free to check it out. That is Merlin from Queen Games. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.